okay, please stop. Uh, we'll go over the solutions. Uh, so one thing I would like to, to uh, before I go over the solution, two things I'd like to mention, right, regarding the uh, midterm on one step. Uh, as I mentioned multiple times, midterm is open book, but uh, I want to make sure we are computer scientists, right? Everything must be well defined. So open book, uh, I have to define what I mean by open book. Open book means that you can access textbook, lecture slides, homework and homework solutions, and quiz and quiz solutions. Okay? Is that well defined? That means you can, if you want to, you can print out those materials and bring with you, or you can just bring your laptop and access everything on our course website. But that's the only thing uh, you can go to. Okay? If, if I spot you go beyond any website outside our class website, you will be ejected from the midterm immediately. Okay? So don't destroy my trust. And some of you asked me whether I can bring additional notes since it's open book. The answer is no, because that will be uh, open-ended. It's not open book in that case. Because with, with, with notes, uh, I don't know what you're going to write on those notes, right? So, uh, so I want to make sure we, and that create an uneven ground. Uh, it's mostly from a fairness point of view. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure everybody has access to the same materials uh, uh, rather than having, uh, having open notes. Uh, yes, we have a question over there. So what could we possibly write that wouldn't be already included in the notes? In the no, you cannot bring open notes. You cannot bring open notes. Right, but that's what I'm saying. What could you write in the notes that could possibly not already be in the lecture slides? Well, I don't know. It's, it's not defined. It's not well defined. You can write anything. Uh, once I have open notes, you can bring anything, right? It, 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 there's no debate on this. It's, uh, it's I define the policy and you obey the policy. Open book means that you refer to the lecture slides, uh, uh, textbook, and that's already, uh, I think that's already a lot of resources you can, you can access. Okay, question? And that's including the notes you're taking class very much. Well, that's a good question. So if you make additional notes on the lecture slide, if you print them out, if you want to uh, have some additional notes on those lecture slides, that's a gray area. I don't know. I mean, uh, what, what I can do is if you, I, I would strongly encourage you to just bring your laptop and because I would imagine if you print out all the lecture slides, that's a lot of lecture slides you're going to print, right? So if you're going to have some notes on those lecture slides, minor notation, things like that, I will have a look at those. Then based on my uh, judgment, I will either allow or reject it. Okay, do not have extensive notes on your lecture slides. If you have just minor notation for clarification purpose, then that's okay. But then you have to let me know first before you refer to those notes on the lecture slide, lecture slide you're gonna print. Question over there? Is the entire course website free game? Like yes, the entire course website you can access. Lecture slides, homework solution, quiz solution, everything on the website. So I would strongly encourage you just bring your laptop, sync some trees, uh, do not print the lecture slides. If you do print the lecture slides, make sure at the back, if you decide to print one page, one side is lecture slide. At the back is a blank page, right? You cannot write anything on the back. You can add minor notation to the slide itself, that's understandable, but not extensive notes. We all know uh, what that means, right? So don't play a game here, right? So uh, that's, what I, that's what I will ask you to do. Uh, please stick to these policies. Uh, any question regarding that? Yes. What would you suggest we, we sort of study? Because normally I would go back and study lecture slides or homework solutions to prepare for the The exam. way you prepare for the midterm, uh, the best way to prepare for the midterm is to simply go over all the homework <coughs> and quiz problems and make sure you can solve them without looking at the solution I have provided. If you can do, let's say not maybe not 100% of those problems, but if you can solve 80 to 90% of those problems, you will do well in the, in the midterm. You don't need any additional materials in preparing for the midterm. All the, t I promise you, all the problem types that you're gonna see in the midterm have already, you have already seen them in, uh, in your homework. All quiz. You can pretty much tell the style of my test from the quiz I've, I've been giving out, right? That's kind of like a mini midterm uh, style test that you will be doing, right? So if you think you can solve the quiz problem, 
then you will have no trouble to do well in the midterm. On the other hand, if you find the quiz very challenging, that means you need to pick up a little bit more. Of course, midterm is open book and quiz has been closed book, which means quiz is somewhat harder uh, than what you will expect in the, in the midterm. And the problem type will be the same, but I mean, without being able to access the materials, it makes it a little bit harder for you to solve the problem. But the point I want to I try to make is the open book really, to me, uh, I think it's just a ease of mind to let you relax and calm down more than anything else. You know? uh, solving this problem, as you see from the quiz, having open book versus having no open book access, I don't think it makes a big difference. If you don't understand, you don't understand. Even if I give you all the material from the slides and everything, if you don't study ahead of time, if you just rely on those one and a half hour during the quiz and try to understand what the slide says, you know, I think you know, that's not the strategy you want to take. <coughs> right, so as I mentioned a lot of times, open book is really just a way to calm you down, to relax and do the best, uh, to show the best of your understanding, right? More than being able to copy solution from uh, one of the existing problems. Does that make sense? Because we're not asking when will this battle uh, uh, take place? Then open book and closed book can make a big huge difference, right? Uh, so that, that's essentially my point. Okay, that means that let's look at the uh, uh, quiz number three solutions. The first one, find the name of all students from the CS department with more than one major. So this problem actually has a few constraints. First of all, must be a student from the CS department. But that's one constraint you have to do. For solving that constraint, all you need to do is what? Is to look at the major table that tells you which student major in which department. And select the student ID with department equal to CS. That will give you all the students from CS. Does that make sense? But that's not good enough. Because if you do that, and you do a group by student ID, if you do a count, you only have one department for each student, because you limit the department name to CS. So in order to find additional department that a student has majored in, you need to involve another instance of the major table. And join what you have with that second major table. We use this trick a multiple of time. Think about the sailors who reserve a green and color boat. Right? What we do, we have two copies of the reserve and the boat instance, and make sure in the first instance is green, in the second instance is, is red. And there's another instance where we use this trick, I forgot the details, but that's essentially what you're going to do right here as well. So, that being said, <laughs> So you, join, you need to involve the student table as well because you need the student name. You need to access the name attribute of student. And you join a student with major, the first copy of the major table, make sure student ID are the same. And then department name equal to CS. At the same time, you also join the student record with the second copy of the major table, which is M1 over there. Make sure they talk about the same student. What I give you is, if you think about it, what I give you is in the cross product, after enforcing, or enforcing this uh, where condition, what you have is student info, student information. So there are a bunch of attributes regarding the student information from the student table, right? Then you also have the copy of the first copy of major, but in this case, all the department value is CS. Student ID value might be different depending on which uh, current student you're talking about. And this is your cross part. Right? And what about the last part? Last part is another major instance. But here, this department value is no longer constrained to CS. It's whatever department that this student majors at. Could be, of course, CS will be one of it, because you have to be in, 
measure the NCS in order to qualify for the joint condition. But in addition, you may major in some other department, like math. And then this is the second student with only CS, the third student with CS, and some other department. Does that make sense? That's what you have after the joint. Then with this, you do your partition using group I. So this will <coughs> end up in one group. Let's say, assuming they have the same student ID, one over one, one over one, and this is the one over two. This is one over three, and so on and so forth. So this will be one group, this will be another group, this is another group. And then for each group, you count the distinct number of department value. That tells you <coughs> how many majors this CS student has. Every single record here is a CS student for sure because of this constraint, right? And then you count the second copy of a uh, major instance to find out the number of majors the student has. Then you operate. Okay, question on this. Uh, second question is the division. I, I will skip. I mean, I have talked about division for so many times. Uh, there are two ways of solving this problem you can use in you can use group by having, like what I show here, or you can use two double, uh, double negation logic, two not like this, right? We have talked about this many, many times. There are two or three problems in the homework as well, so I will skip this. Yeah, question. So, what would happen if we don't include the distinct number in the Would it be In this case, it might not be because the same course number may appear multiple times in different sessions. We want to get rid of those duplicates to make sure, because the, the problem specifically asks for counting course by course number only, rather than counting same course multiple times in different sessions. So you do need that listing. But you do not need the listing for the counting from the course table because course number is the key for that. Having this thing or not over there has no effect. Okay, last problem. The last problem is exactly the same as what I went over last lecture on your homework three, regarding your homework three, right? What, what do we talk about? The student with the max GPA from each age group or something like that, right? We talk about that, right? <coughs> Yeah, I think I did, right? So I explained that in details, which is the same as find the name of the oldest sailor, find the name of the oldest student. So what you do is this. I mean, this is exactly the same as what I talked about last Wednesday. So you should have no excuse for not being able to solve this. If you have no, if you have trouble in not being able to solve this, I guarantee you, and I will make sure that you will have trouble in solving the midterm test. Right? So, so make sure you, you pay attention to this. What you do is, in the outer block, you simply count the number of students each department has for those departments with 30, more than 30 PhD students. Since number of PhD students is an attribute of the department, you don't even need to count that. You just do a where, in the where clause, you just check this value. And this will disqualify all the departments who has less than 30 PhD students. For the remaining departments, you do a group by you count. That tells you the number of students they have for the department who have more than 30 PhD students. But we're interested in the one that has maximum number of students. So you make sure you're, what you're looking for is a group that has count greater than or equal to all of such counts. Then that must be the department with the max number of students. <laughs> Okay, question on this? So if you look at the time I allocated for each quiz, quiz number three, you have 15 minutes, roughly five minutes per query, right? Uh, I think that's sufficient time because if you look at problem two and problem three, that's the exact same type I have gone over, now it's the third time I gone over these problems. I talked about this in lecture slides, I went over this in homework three, now I will go over them once more at quiz. <coughs> So five minutes per such query, I think is sufficient. That being said, you will still have more time in your midterm and open book than what you have, the time you have for your quiz, which is closed. 
Right? So the purpose of the quiz is really to, it's a stress test. The worst case, system performance, right? Okay, all right. So uh, to make sure you study, make sure you understand this, this materials, we have gone over it over and over again in lecture slides, in homework, and in quiz. And uh, good luck on your midterm on Wednesday. Any question on this? No? Okay. Fantastic. I will post the solution to the quiz right after the lecture, so you have access to this. Now let's come back to functional dependencies. Okay? Uh, so we talked about functional dependency in last lecture. Uh, what we said is functional dependency x determines y Oh, by the way, for, for the midterm on Wednesday, uh, you do not have access, you cannot access the database server to type your SQL query, right? You, you cannot do that, okay? Functional dependencies, uh, x determines y with respect to a schema R means the following. Right? It means that for any legal instance of that schema capital R, for any legal instance small r from that schema capital R, you may have many, many different uh, legal instances for the same schema. Right? So for example, if you have a student schema, you can have numerous possible instances of the student table as long as you satisfy the key and the domain constraints from the student schema. You follow me? Right? So for example, given any student instance, I can easily get another instance by either deleting a student record or inserting a new student record or update a value from the existing student record to get a new instance for that student schema. Right? So there could be many, many possible instances of the same schema. Functional dependency, functional dependency says for any such legal instance, it must be a legal instance. What do I mean by a legal instance? For example, I have a student table. And it has an age column, and I have a constraint called check, age greater than 18, and so on and so forth. If that's my input, then an instance where you have student ID one one name equal to let's say Fei Fei. Okay? Of course you may have many other records. One, three. This is not a legal instance. Even though I really wish this is this is true, but uh, but this is not a legal instance, okay? <coughs> because this record uh, has violated you can script for the H column, right? So that's not a legal instance. But once I delete this record, that becomes a legal instance. Okay? For any such instance, x determines y means that for any such instance, small r, and, and any two random records of U choice from this instance, meaning T1 and T2, you make the random choice. You select whatever record you want. If the x value of T1 and T2 are the same, then it's guaranteed the y value must be the same. Okay? Do I have an example? So I will show you some examples, right? So what's important to note is that a functional dependency is a statement about every legal instance of that schema. Meaning that you cannot, you cannot infer a functional dependency by looking at one particular instance. Because what holds with respect to a particular instance may not hold when your instance has changed. Does that make sense? For example, if you look at this class, let's assume Every one of you 
it's for the argument sake, right? Obviously, that's not, that's not the case. But let's say it so happened that for this particular class, every student is from the state of Utah. Okay? You cannot, based on, by, in, by inspecting this particular instance and derive a function of dependencies that it says, it says enrollment in a DB class infers you are from Utah. You cannot have that function of dependency by looking at only this instance. Does it make sense? Right? So function of dependency really, what, so the, that brings up another question, which is where does a function of dependency arise from? Where do you get your function of dependency from? Well, you get your function of dependency from user specification. Your customer will tell you what kind of data dependencies they have in their applications. In their applications. Okay? The next question you may have regarding functional dependency is what is the relationship between functional dependency and the key of a schema, of the key of the schema? Actually, the two has, have a really strong relationship. Functional dependency and the key of a schema have a really strong relationship. In particular, for any schema R, we have the following functional dependency, which is, suppose, K is a schema, is a key of <coughs> schema R. Note that this K might not be a single attribute. Doesn't necessarily to be a single attribute. It could be a combination of, uh, of attributes. Does that make sense? Doesn't have to be a single attribute. It can be a combination of attributes for the key of a schema, right? So it, it simply denotes the key of schema R. Could be a single attribute, could be a combination of attributes from R. Then you always have Uh, the key K determines all the other attributes in the schema R. Determine everything in schema R. Why? Why is that? Can someone tell me? Why is that? Why the key of the schema determines every attribute in the schema of R? I want to explain the, the rationale behind it. Yes. Is it because uh, uh, and no two rows can have the same key? That's actually what's in there? Five. Sorry? Five. Perhaps said because no two records can have the same key value. Some of you may wonder why that has to do with this. The reason is no matter what legal instance you can find with respect to schema R, and no matter, no matter what, what two random records you have chosen from that legal instance, their x value can never be the same with respect to the key k. Does that make sense? Okay. This means guarantees always. Okay. The protection of the attribute of from the key will never be the same for those two random records. What that means is you never need to worry about whether the y value are the same or not. Uh, this is the example I gave you towards the end of last lecture. If tomorrow is sunny, Fei-Fei will be playing tennis. So when it comes to tomorrow, you look at the, the weather, and it, if it's sunny outside, what well, you can tell? You tell Fei-Fei is playing tennis for sure. But if, it's, but if it's raining or snowing or whatever, can you tell whether Fei-Fei is playing tennis or not? You cannot. I may be playing tennis, I may not. <coughs> Does that make sense? I didn't, in my original statement, I didn't make any assertion with respect to what happens to my activity if it's not sunny. 
So same thing here. Functional dependence says if the x value are the same, y value must be the same. If x value is not the same, y value could be the same, y value could be different. I don't care. It always holds. X determines y always holds if that's the case. Give you a particular example. Let's say Mark is student. Mark schema is student. And what's the key? One of the key is SID. Right? And what this says is SID determines student name. And for that matter, determines everything else from that student schema. Obviously, this makes sense. Why? Because once you know the student ID value, the name of the student is fixed. However, two students with different student ID values may or may not have the same name, but I don't care because functional dependency didn't, doesn't say anything about that case if X is not the same. In this case, if X ID value are not the same, I don't know whether the name of the same are the same or not. I, I don't care. It's false. Do you follow me? So that's some discussion we have regarding the definition of functional dependency. Okay? Now, let me give you a concrete example okay, to understand this better. Suppose I have a schema, car, uh, schema as hourly employees. This is one of the examples we use for the ER department, right? the hierarchical uh, structure. Right? It's a hierarchical structure. We have employee, hourly employee, and contract employee. Let's say we choose to have two tables for, a, is a, for that is a hierarchy structure. So I have an hourly employee table like this, which take the hourly employee specific attribute and all the attribute from the employee table. So we, get, we end up with this table. Right? And let me explain the name, the meaning of each attribute. Social security number that's trivial, the name, the lot, reading which power and hours per week. Okay, let's say the lot, what is the lot? Lot, let's say, is kind of like a parking lot, right? Where this employee park his or her car at, okay? Working for this company. You have a assigned lot. Like you guys have a U lot, I have an A lot. Does that make sense? Okay, that's what lot means, for example. Okay? And for simplicity, I'm gonna represent this schema using the first letter of is attribute of every attribute in the schema. So this schema is SNLRWH, which is simply the first letter of single of every single attribute from the schema in the same sequence, of course, in the same order as they appear in the schema. Okay, that's a very simple dependency, right? Rating determines W. What's wrong with it? You may wonder. Okay, so far it's good. Some this is like a brain teaser problem uh, I'm giving, uh, uh, we are having here. So what's the point? It's more than a brain teaser problem, okay? Uh, this goes back to uh, the evil of redundancy in a database. Uh, let me give you a specific 